you forward on the friends of the Northeast Community College. And on behalf of Northeast Mississippi Community College, our uh, Cultural Arts Committee here at Northeast Mississippi Humanities Council, we want to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you for attending tonight's lecture. And I want to say a special thank you to our uh, Cultural Arts Committee for the work that they have, have exhibited in making this, this possible for us tonight. One of the things that we have done here in all things since I became president was to uh, instill in the people the, the importance of um, workforce and things like that. And I know you're sitting there thinking, where is he going with this? <laughs> uh, my point is this, in order to attract industry into any community, the arts must be very visible to attract the type of industry and the type of employers that we need. The, the arts must be visible in every form and fashion. And that's the role that I want Northeast to play, not only in the community here in, in Prentiss County, but also in each of our counties throughout Northeast, Northeast Mississippi, that we enhance the, the fine arts and how important they are just in the day-to-day -day activities of every, everyone's life. So I, I certainly appreciate each one of you coming and being part of this tonight. And as we go out, we spread the word of the importance of, of, of art and cultural arts in our society today. So again, on behalf of Northeast and everyone here, we welcome you tonight. We want you to sit back. We have a great, great lecture plan for you with an outstanding uh, faculty member. So we want you to sit back and enjoy the evening and enjoy the time. We're glad to have you here. Thank you so much.
As art club advisor, she has planned field trips to museums in Memphis, Nashville, Birmingham, and most recently in Atlanta. She has worked with the administration to upgrade equipment and served on the curriculum committee to develop and implement new curriculum on the, and on the strategic planning council contributing to college goals. While at Northeast, she has taught design, interior design and art appreciation and has developed and taught new courses in ceramics and most recently art history and painting. During her spare time, she judges art shows, consults on design projects, and consults for members of the Mississippi Craftsman's Guild. She shares her home with her parents, Thomas and Barbara Shin, and her fuzzy four-legged friends. Her presentation tonight is called The Art Connection, which will highlight many areas of study with a central connecting point of art. Our Northeast Mississippi Community College Humanities Teacher of the Year, Ms. Melody Shin. presentation I have chosen um, the art connection because I wanted to highlight just how many connections there are with art not only in the humanities but in a broad range of areas of study. Okay? Um, first I want to get one thing out of the way though. Okay? Um, I have a number of thank yous to say to a lot of people sitting here in this room. Um, first of all everybody who's attending tonight I appreciate you being here because you do have an understanding of our personal obligations that you can be taking care of at this time. Um, my parents who were not able to be here tonight, um, Thomas and Barbara Shin, for not being judgmental and wanting to major in art when I went to college. Uh, my grandparents, Tom and Jesse May Shin, for their support throughout the years. Um, the Cultural Arts Committee for putting this event together. I know a lot of work went into this and my peers on the committee for your confidence and consideration for the honor. Um, the administration has been very supportive of the arts since I have been here, um, especially our President Ricky Ford, um, Executive Vice President Craig Ellis Sasser, um, Vice President of Instruction Willa Jones, and our Chief Financial Officer Chris Murphy, and also can't leave out Patrick Heaton over the foundation. So we've received some really great support pretty much across the board. Um, Ray Harris, our division head, whenever you ask for someone to work for, um, could not be a better person. And whenever we think about our division members, not only in art, but in music and theater as well, a better group of colleagues could not be asked for. Um, when it comes to um, where we are located, even though we are outside of music and theater physically, um, Janice Patterson looks after us really well over here in Mexico, so included within the humanities quite well. And of course, we can't leave out Betty Johnson, who really keeps us, keeps us going. Okay? Um, when it comes to why we're here, um, the students, you guys are the most important reason we are here. Yeah, I'm glad that you can't, but you did choose to come tonight, and I hope you find some things that you can find. This. I hope I have some presentation items that you'll find interesting as well. So um, this is for you guys. Um, what we do and what I do as an instructor is not um, is not just the work of one, but it's the work of many. It's the work of many people sitting here in this room. And I don't want to highlight that importance. So now we're going to talk a little bit about art. And whenever we talk about the art connection, exactly what exactly what that does mean. Um, Sometimes when we think about art, you know, we're going to think about different movements uh, in art. We think about immediately painting, photography, sculpture, or we may think about the methods of making art with drawing pencils, paint, clay, you know, how we're going to do it, what we're going to use. Um, some art ideas that relate directly to art forms, color, style, texture, light, all of those are very important components. What may not immediately come to mind, though, are just how interrelated art forms are within specialized areas of study within the humanities um, and even beyond these areas of study. So some things that we might not immediately associate with art, and those are some things that I'm going to use as examples tonight. Um, so I've chosen five areas to discuss. 
some may be more familiar than others, but hopefully you will leave with a maybe a broader range of better understanding about what you know, real art might be able to do individually. And then that to me is the most important thing, you know, making that connection, uh, making that individual personal connection with art. What it, you know, what it does for us, uh, what it does for us in society, how it fits into our lives. Now, the first example that I've chosen tonight um, is to talk about literature and art. Um, secondly will be science, third is mathematics, then criminal justice, okay? Um, and then following that, a brief discussion on where this all started for me, you know, making these connections. Um, the first illustration tonight is We've got a good picture here, um, is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Okay? Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, we know in literature as a poem, a great epic poem. Um, and in this particular illustration that you're seeing, um, this is a reconstructed line of art, okay? or a reconstructed line. And how this ties in is that you have some of the illustrations from that great epic visually on this piece of this piece of this music history. Um, one of the oldest pieces of literature that dates to about 2100 BC is visible in an artistic sense on this piece of um, this musical instrument that goes back, actually it predates that about 2026 to 2400 BC. So we're looking at a visual sense of the story before it's even written down. Perhaps there were some writings that were done on it about it, but the clay tablets that tell the story, actually tell the story, you know, date periodically after that. So we have this visual story that's presented here to us um, from a piece, piece of literature, and what it tells us the story of are scenes from the adventures of Gilgamesh on his quest for immortality uh, or eternal life. So he has all of these adventures, all of these individuals and um, creatures that he comes into contact with. Um, one of the things that I want us to pay attention to, well, we can you know, look at it, it is a beautifully made piece, um, it is reconstructed from what was originally there. The original pieces are the lapis lazuli, which are the blue, okay, the blue stone. You have silver and shell inlays as well to make up the decorative patterns along the lower front part of the piece. And whenever we think about you know, the gold, um, that adds to the adds to it as well because when you're looking at pieces like this that come from the location it does in the ancient Near East, which is southern, this piece located specifically in southern Iraq, um, we think that, yeah, you know, it's, it's a great possibility that, you know, there's going to be some vis visual ideas that go along with all these stories. The next illustration, this one is, this one is very similar. Um, it's a slightly different version of this, but I, could find, I found a really close-up picture, so I could a fairly close-up picture, so you could get a little more detail on this. And one thing that I want you to pay close attention to is on the right, um, to the right side of this, the very last panel down at the bottom. Now you see a figure form there. It looks kind of like a hybrid form, scorpion, part man. Okay. Well, this last panel, this scorpion man, is described in. Sumerian and Akkadian history and folklore, more or less, um, as being a big guardian to the interests of the underworld. Right? So we're dealing with a pretty old idea here. Okay? Uh, you know, we're going on 4,000 years old as far as this idea goes. Um, what I want to pull out from here is, is that we have a modern interpretation of that that some of you guys will be immediately familiar with when I go to the next to the next image. <laughs> I think y'all will probably recognize this, okay? Because I steal from the Scorpion King, okay? Um, the Scorpion King, even though it's not perfectly in line with a lot of the folklore and a lot of the history even, um, is what can happen whenever Hollywood writers get a hold of this kind of idea, okay? And how they take it and create visual effects and recreate from their imaginations what exactly can happen. Okay. Um, so when it comes to um, when it comes to creativity, when it comes to art forms, um, and tying all this together, 
We have a representation of art with music, a musical instrument, literature, okay, um, history, because there is a good bit of history that goes into this, and then modern day filmmaking. Okay. So when it comes to you know how that translates to us in modern, you know, in our modern times, you know, how do we how is this relevant? What's important to us? We go back sometimes to a lot of very ancient, very old ideas in figuring out, you know, maybe how, to, how to create something new, how to create something different by working with something very old. Okay. Uh, now, the film, yeah, they get you into Egypt, and there is some folklore that deals with the Scorpion Man in Egypt. So they took the two, the Assyrian stories, the Akkadian stories, the stories out of uh, the ancient Near East, and they blended them together with the Egyptian, and guess what? You get this type of film. That's what happens. So, when it comes to literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh was the beginning of pretty much where this came from, okay? Um, the next topic, <clears throat> when it comes to science, there is a great deal of science that goes into creating many art forms, okay? Um, we deal with different types of chemicals whenever we're working with ceramics, we deal with different types of chemicals whenever we're working with photography, and photography is what I chose to highlight tonight. So, what can you, you know, how does, how does all that work? How did all that happen? Well, um, photography and the idea of photography has been around way back before Da Vinci's time, okay? The idea of the camera obscura that dark room. Now, <clears throat> when we're thinking about a dark room and how exactly it works, okay, um, we have to think about photography as having a controlled environment, okay? a controlled dark environment to be, to be able to make it successful. Okay? Because we are, in a sense, riding with the light, creating that image. So um, the light controls have to be, um, have to be monitored very carefully. Now, the image that you've got here is what Da Vinci's, um, I would say, one of his boxes of sketches and such was taken from, <clears throat> that is called the Codex Atlanticus. Right? And this is where he started writing about, um, where he started writing about the camera obscura and his ideas about photography. Basically how some sort of mechanical device could mimic what the human eye sees and create an image. Um, he was writing about this in 1502. Okay, so several hundred years ago, the idea was there, the technology didn't exist to make it possible, but certainly the idea was there to be able to create something like this. Um, da Vinci first published this fairly clear description of what, you know, what early photography could be like or what the camera obscura could do for us. Okay? So just to give you a little brief description of the camera obscura, okay? if you have a darkened, completely darkened room, completely enclosed room, the way the camera obscura works is you would have to have a very tiny hole or a pinhole in one single wall in one single place. Okay? Whenever bright sunlight shines outside and through that tiny little pinhole, the idea is whatever is outside shows up inside in the darkened room inverted shows up upside down. So taking that into consideration, um, yeah, there are a lot of different ways that could be utilized for art because we could, we could use it to make pictures. The only issue was is you have this great big box that couldn't possibly be moved. The person had to be, the artist had to be inside the box to make it work, okay? You know, so you know, that really just wasn't very, wasn't very, very workable until they started making things smaller, okay? And when it comes to photography, of course, Probably everybody sitting in this room has the capability with you to make pictures for your cell phone. So the way that we think about photography from that time to this time obviously has changed a great deal. One of those reasons, one of the reasons is, is because the process has changed so much. Of all of the different media, art media that we work with, photography has gone through the most significant changes. And I wanted to describe a couple of those for you tonight. Um, the early photographers, they're pretty much more chemists than they were artists, okay? And that's where this where the science of uh, making photos comes into play, because they were searching for ways to use light to create an image on a surface, and they experimented with a lot of different ways to do that. Lots of different chemicals, lots of different types of surfaces, especially metals, 
uh, even glass, anything they thought they could capture in the jump. Um, a lot of the chemicals were dangerous, a lot of them were toxic, um, very unstable. So when we look at um, their persistence in doing this, you know, they really did have to be really persistent to try to make this thing work. Um, so from the time Da Vinci wrote about the idea and the concepts that he had, you had a lot of other people picking up these concepts and picking up these ideas and trying to figure out just exactly what you know what to do, how does it, how can we make this work? Um, the first successful image was created by this guy. Somebody you may not know immediately from photography or from history, um, Joseph Nicifor Macy from France. Um, he created the first image in eight, somewhere between 1826 and 1827. Um, he gets credit pretty much for that. He was working with chemicals on a sensitized pewter plate. It was actually the tin coated pewter. And we might think, well, how in the world could he possibly have captured an image? Well, he did, and it worked. Um, when it comes to the type of image he captured, let me just that this is not too impressive by today's standards, okay? but the important thing was is that it actually worked. What he did was take, to take this pewter plate and expose it to light for somewhere at least eight hours. And if you look at the shadows, the shadowy effect, the image is pretty vague, but it's a landscape. It's outside his home. So he set it up, set it up um, and let it be exposed for an entire day, because if you look at the shadows, the shadows change in the piece, you know, as the sun is moving, okay? So it shows us that, you know, it gives us an idea of exposure time, so at least, it had to be at least an all day, uh, an all day um, exposure. So the issue with this was, of course, everything had to be perfectly still for that amount of time to make it work, okay? So we're looking at very limited uses for what he came up with, but, 12 to 13 years later, whenever Louis the Year came up with the year type, he shortened that exposure time from eight hours to probably less than 30 minutes. So that was a huge, huge innovation and a huge step forward. Um, other innovators followed. We had a lot of um, U.S. innovators. There was a professor at Hamilton Smith in Ohio. He even invented the tin type. Um, the tin types became synonymous with poultry images of the Civil War. Those little tiny pictures that the soldiers carried along with them or traded with one another with their family members. Um, Matthew Brady, he spent his entire family fortune out there in photography stalking in the Civil War because he realized how big an event it was going to be and felt that it was really important to be able to have that volume of information all together. Early in the 20th century, the photographer Alfred Stiglitz opened a gallery in New York City dedicated to art and helping other artists <coughs> make a living. Okay? He wasn't looking at photography and art from a competitive point of view. He was looking at it from a point of view of the point of view of being able to help other individuals, help other professional photographers get their name out there, make a living. And um, a lot of those artists would not have been known as well as they were in the early part of the 20th century if it had not been for students and his persistence in marketing them. Um, when it comes to women in photography as well, Margaret Burke White played a tremendous role in the 1930s whenever she became the lead photographer for Life Magazine. So if any of you guys remember Life Magazine, you know, that was one of the premier magazines of its time, the premier publications. She went all over the world making pictures and bringing those into our homes and she recognized how important that was. Now, we have the internet today, so we have all of these images that are so readily accessible. That was, more or less, our best method of getting world information at that time. She, like I said, she paved the way for women in the field in the 1930s. And of course, Lenny Smith Kovac had come along in the meantime. Um, they introduced color film, we were working with more negatives and sensitized papers. So this one saying things changed a great deal. That is just a very quick synopsis of what of what's happened with photography. So yes, he has and has undergone any other ch any changes, uh, more so than any medium, thanks to the early innovators. They transformed photography from being a room, a camera that could capture images, the camera obscura, into from a chemical process into a digital electronic medium 
that this microscopic in size in comparison that now we can all own individually in our cell phones. So naturally, any one of you who is a younger audience member has a completely different association with the medium because of this transformation. It has totally, totally changed. So I just wanted to let you guys know, look, we may not know where it came from. So those chemical processes have led to what we've got now. Okay? So that's where the application comes in to, to where, we, where we are today with that. Now, mathematics. Okay? When it comes to math, okay, some of us artists, we may have a little bit of a disdain for math. But it still is a very important factor, it's a very important aspect in creating art forms, especially architectural forms. So the images I'm showing you tonight, some of y'all will recognize immediately. We've got the Acropolis, okay? The Acropolis in Athens, Greece, okay? The highest point pretty much where you can see out across the Aegean. You have at the top of the Acropolis, the top of this rocky hilltop, a group of Greek temples, okay? the largest of which is the Parthenon. Now, the Parthenon was built during the classical age of Greek culture um, on the Acropolis, and it dates back to the age of Pericles, the great general. Now, looking at where it was built, approximately 447 BC to 438 BC, um, that was the general time that it was constructed, but then they continued adding decorations, adding sculptural forms, up until about 432 BC, so for another six years, those sculptural programs continued because it was quite extensive. Um, the building served as a treasury for the Delhi League, and that's exactly, actually, how they got the thing built to begin with, is because Pericles was collecting war contributions from all the other city-states that they were protecting, that the Athenians protected. And so those war contributions built up to be a pretty good amount. And he decided that this project of all these buildings on the Acropolis would be a rebuilding project after the Persian War because they had been pretty devastated. So this was, this was a new project for Greece as far as building and art and culture were. Now, he hired out these two architects, Sictimus and Philocrates, to come up with the designs. And Phidias was another sculptor. He was in charge of all of the sculptural programs, which were pretty extensive, inside and outside. Pretty much everything was covered with sculpture. So this Doric temple dedicated to a thing got to be a pretty big thing, okay? It was controversial during this time because it did take so much to build, okay? Because it cost so much. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, the Athenian citizens, you know, question, just as we did today, should we spend this amount of money building this type of structure on this type of project? Um, <coughs> the, way the, the way the Acropolis and the way the Parthenon appears today, it's pretty much like this, okay? And when we look at it, it has had quite a few ravages from time. Um, we have to use our imagination to go back to what it looks like, but we're going to look at that at the end anyway. Um, the way it appears today is the same. Most of the damage in 1687, 1687, whenever the Venetian shelled the building, okay. um, it had been used as a munition storage. Uh, they put gunpowder up there for some reason, and whenever it was shelled, naturally, it blew out the inner chambers and it blew the roof off the building. So, that's where it sustained the greatest amount of damage. Um, they have been, the Greek government has been working for years to try to salvage what is there, to try to make the most of it as well. Um, another issue that came about between 1801 and 1812, Greece was under Turkish control. So there was an issue there. Lord Elgin, who was an emissary from um, Great Britain, came over and made an agreement with the Turks to be able to take sculptural pieces from the Acropolis and purchase those, okay? So approximately half the sculptural forms that were on the Parthenon and a lot from the Propylaea, a lot from the Erythea, those were all removed gradually and slowly and shipped back to Great Britain. Um, <clears throat> later, Lord Elgin sold those, that was in 1816, he sold them to the British government, who in turn turned them over to the British Museum. 
So that's how they're not running our day. Okay? Um, the British government and Greece have been fighting it out, trying to, Greece has been trying to get the pieces repatriated. So the way we see it today is not anything close to what it, what it was originally like. So like I said, we have to take our imagination, let use our imagination, take ourselves back to that. Now, in looking at the parking lot, um, <clears throat> there's a specific mathematical formula that was applied to building this particular, um, this particular structure. It's called the golden mean of the golden section. Some of you guys may have heard that. It's a ratio of four to nine. It appears in the plan, the sides, the space in between the columns, too many places to be pure coincidence. Okay? So it was pretty well planned. Um, so somewhere between Pythagoras and his theorem, back in the 5th and 16th century BC, this structure was built between that time and whenever he would introduce us to his geometry, um, about 300 BC. So this falls in between there. So there were certainly a lot of mathematical innovations that were going on. Now, when we look at this, if you guys can see the graphics here that have been applied to the base of the parking lot, you can see this is a spiral. And this spiral is what is derived from the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence, if you take a number and add it to um, the two numbers, you get, well, you take the number, you add it to another number, and then you get a derivative from that. But, um, we graph that on the front of the parking lot, so it does have that special proportional relationship in that in that particular sequence. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to figuring out these units of measure, um, that was something special too that the Greeks did. The next illustration, this one is pretty much just a graphic illustration on um, you know the different proportions <coughs> to scale. And you can see that there are definitely repeated units and how they are repeated in sequence as well. So we can we can break this this down mathematically. Now when it comes to when it comes to you know how the parts gonna look, okay, it wasn't all about mathematics. It was about visual beauty as well because they wanted a blending of the two. Um, and they tweaked it a little bit. There are certain things that they did to the building that weren't mathematically correct, but it was meant to make the building more vis visually appealing. Um, that is, the columns at each corner are a little bit larger because when the sunlight's behind the building, if they were all the same size, they would actually look smaller. They had an intasis, they curved the steps, they put curves in certain places because if you were looking at the building from a distance and you're looking at a flat surface, that optical illusion that happens is it makes the step sag. So they added just a slight curvature to it. So it was how we visually appreciate the building, you know, how we how we see the structure. So they did, they tweaked it a good deal whenever they did this. So yeah, it doesn't look so great now, but um, we have a replica very close by, if you guys were not aware, in Nashville. So, if you do have an opportunity to visit Nashville, this is definitely a place to check out. You can check out the entire building. It looks very, it's very similar as far as construction, um, visually, dimensionally, and even on the inside, they have a nice 40 foot replica of the as well. So it does give us a very similar, uh, similar appearance as to what the, what the original was would have been like. So going back and looking, look at the original, look at what it would have been like. Um, we can get it, we can, we can get a better appreciation of it, and we are still copying it to this day. Right? Um, this one was built in Nashville in 1897. So you know, thousands of years afterwards, you know, it still has significant meaning to us, and we still use the mathematics and the mathematic ratios in you know, creating our books today, creating our buildings and structures. Um, the Greeks have more of a lasting impression upon our buildings when it comes to modernism and postmodernism than any other culture. So we've got to hand it to them. Um, they also were known for being very innovative in how they did their mathematics. Um, they had artists coming from all over Greece to work on the Parthenon, and they came up with a unit of measure that would developed a way for converting units into one single unit of measure from all these different individuals to be able to construct the building using one single unit. So 
Brian, when we look at mathematics, you know, it's not bad for the fits and safe, okay? But it really did come up with some very innovative ways to solve problems. And when we look at mathematics, when we look at um, art, we are, we're solving problems. It teaches us how to, teaches us how to think about that. Um, <clears throat> the next topic we've got is criminal justice, okay? And with criminal justice, um, I've got a picture here. How many different things do you think you can see in this one painting? This is Jan Vermeer's uh, Mistress and the Maid. It's from the 17th century. It's a Dutch painting. And it's owned by the Frick Museum in New York City. Now, the reason I brought up, brought up criminal justice is because this is one of those subject areas where we might not really realize you know, how art could be utilized. Um, we might think about mug shots, we might think about images that might be created by sketch artists from verbal descriptions, something like that, which are very, very useful. Okay? We've got a catalog of criminals, and we can visually come up with ideas of what those criminals look like if we need to. Um, but in 2004, the New York City Police Department um, developed a training program in conjunction with the Freak Museum of New York City. And the objective of that program was to enhance visual observation skills and improve verbal communication. Um, what they recognized was is that in a lot of instances, the um, detectives especially had a very short amount of time to observe a crime scene and determine exactly what was happening to find the truth. Um, so what they did is they put a program was put together it's called the Art of Perception. And art is a lot about perception. It teaches us how to see things um, to help the law enforcement professionals assess crime scenes through their observation to minimize the potential for compromising evidence. And that's really what it was all about. Now, the program, since its inception, has been very successful. Um, the individual who introduced the program was Amy Herman. She was the head of the education department, education program at Frick for about 10 years. So she introduced, um, introduced this program by putting together a work, group of works that the detectives used first to determine the facts, then interpret what happened. Okay? Um, the tendency to jump to conclusions too quickly was tried to be, we tried to be avoided. Okay? So when we're thinking about, you know, what we see in a picture, what we see in a painting, um, according to the education department, there are about 80 details that can be seen in this one single painting. And the um, individuals who worked in law enforcement were brought in and they studied these paintings. They studied a lot, very specific pieces in the museum. So that way they could, they could start picking up on those details, first of all assessing exactly what they did see, and then, you know, making a decision about what exactly happened, what's happening in the scene, why is it important, okay? <clears throat> so, in doing this, you know, they could observe scenes very quickly and help speed their reaction times as well as far as how they were handling, how they were processing information. Um, talking to witnesses, how to figure out exactly what was going on. Um, the program has been very successful, successful to the point that it's been duplicated by the FBI, the National Guard, and has even been expanded to include seven medical schools in the New York City area. So this type of program has been, um, has been incredibly beneficial in a number of ways. Okay? So when it comes to thinking about different types of art, different art forms, why do we study it? What can we do with it? It does, it fits into, to me, it fits into modern culture, it fits into our lives in ways that we may not immediately think of, and that's one of the, one of the things I wanted to present to you guys tonight. Now for me, I wanted to share a little bit of personal information here about where it started for me. And for me, it started as a small child with this. Picture reading, okay? <clears throat> so, knowing where I grew up and knowing where I came from, is, to me, is a really important thing. I don't think you should forget that, okay? Um, where it all began was with the, one of the individuals I mentioned. Um, her name was Jessie May Vacation, and she was my grandmother. And she was also a school teacher, very rural area, 
down at Winston County called Kimes, a little community. Um, she taught before she married, and of course back then after you married, you didn't, you didn't teach anymore. So that was pretty much the traditional, pretty much the traditional way. But with my grandmother, <clears throat> she taught me to read by picture reading. So looking at the pictures is really important. I figured that out early on, and I kind of kept it up. Um, when it comes to how that happened, one of the biggest treats that we had going to Granny's house was um, studying in her house and waiting for the bookmobile to come. You guys have to remember the bookmobiles, okay? Now, Miss McNeil, uh, Miss McNeil, she was the librarian at Winston County Library. She would always come on the bookmobile with the driver and she would always ask what we wanted, if there was something special, because Richard Scary's books, like you see in this illustration, Curious George, um, Dr. Seuss, it didn't matter. She would make sure that she tried to have something different every other week or so whenever they could see. You know, she recognized how important it was to how important it was to us because, like I said, we were in a we were in a pretty rural community. Um, so we would wait patiently. Granny would be holding on to our hands because my brother was with me and we were always ready to go run to the bookmobile, get on board and see what was new. Um, so that was always exciting for us when we were small. And of course, once we got our books, then the first thing we wanted to do immediately when we got back in the house was we got to read it, okay? Um, we had to sit down, we had to read it, and we would read it from cover to cover over and over and over. Um, we would probably wear those books out, throw the pages out. And my grandmother was very patient with us as well because she was, she you know, had taught elementary school. She was familiar, of course, with the all the learning, the learning experiences. Um, she would read a story to me when I was really small, and I would, my job was to pay really close attention to that and try to remember as much as I could. And then we had a little bit of fun with that. Um, I would read her the story back or tell her the story back based on pictures first. Um, then that would pro that progress to learning certain words, learning the alphabet, and then finally putting it all together where, yeah, I got the whole thing. I could read, I could tell us, you know, tell the story about the pictures. And whether my grandmother knew it or not, whether she knew that I was a visual learner or if um, it was just teacher's instinct. Um, somehow or another, that teacher from that really small rural community taught me and taught me some things that really stuck with me pretty much my entire life. Um, so it worked. So it is really important to look at the picture. So we have a few pictures to look at tonight and hopefully some, maybe some of these images will, will stick with you. Um, pretty much ever since I've been a visual learner, I think it's very important to study art and I think probably more important now because it increases our connection to who we are, what we do, and the world around us in ways that sometimes, like I said, we don't realize uh, so it's important to what we see, what we do, even on a daily basis, even no matter what we're doing, uh, no matter what profession we tend to see. So that is pretty much all I have for you guys tonight. I really appreciate you attending. Um, and if you guys, if anybody has any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Um, questions? Yes, ma'am. Anybody? No papers? Okay. I think it was a wonderful presentation. I don't know about you, but I learned things tonight. And it opened my eyes to some ways that art is relevant to us. I am here tonight as a representative of the Mississippi Humanities Council. And the council is very pleased to get to sponsor this program. Throughout the month of October and into November, the council celebrates National Arts and Humanities Month by having programs like this and honoring teachers in the humanities at every college in Mississippi. So there's like 30 programs going on um, during October and November. We are very proud of the fact that through those programs, 
we are able to let people like Ms. Shen share the humanities, to share uh, scholarship, to help you see the relevance to your life. You know, the Humanities Council slogan is that the humanities are for everyone. And I think she really showed that tonight. When you see criminal justice, go into the art museum to learn to be better observers. You really get a sense to a quite degree that art, that humanities are for everyone. So it is with a great deal of pleasure tonight that I get to present on behalf of the Mississippi Humanities Council a cash award to Ms. Shen, a certificate. She will also be honored at the um, Awards banquet in February uh, for the Mississippi Humanity Council Awards. Let's give her another. <laughs> we now invite you all to a reception out in the lobby and also encourage you to see some incredible art in the art gallery, some photography, and after what you've learned about photography tonight, you ought to appreciate it even more. Thank you. <laughs>